Hey everyone, it's Cheryl and Kalei with MyLF Training and Consulting. Hello. Cheryl, thank you for joining us. Today we're going to talk about opening your facility. So this may be your first module, uh, depending on how we arrange it. But this is an exciting time, and uh, we have a lot of information for you that is invaluable. And um, you can avoid a lot of mistakes we made and you can we see it as sort of like a road map and you can pick and choose the things to to put money into and not put money into uh, without having to figure it out as you go along like like we did right yeah absolutely even though we hired a consultant right how much of this stuff did they give us none oh my gosh it was horrible but we had no mm -hmm. idea at the time that's right so the big question that I have is, is this business, is it, is it right for you? I mean, you have a passion for it, I assume. Um, it's not just that you have a, a property that you want to do something with. I mean, you have a passion to help seniors and, um, you know, this is, this is what you want to do. And it's important that sh that you have that passion because there'll be times when you won't be getting paid and there'll be times when you know you'll lose money but if you have that passion and the desire and you're doing the right thing it's going to be apparent to anybody who comes to visit your facility that you're doing this for all the right reasons and they're going to feel really comfortable leaving their mom and dad there so is it right for you is this really a, a business that that you want to get into. Cheryl, would you say that this is just an easy business that you could just, oh, you could rent, fill up your house with six residents and go away on vacation like it's a rental property? No, oh my gosh, absolutely not. We we live, eat, and breathe our facility. Um, it's it's a lot of work, a lot of thought, and we're always thinking about our residents even when we're at home. Um, it's, it's difficult, but it's very rewarding. And it would you say, the thing is, it's not like, you know, you you may get your place full and, and you've got the perfect residence and it really is a snapshot in time. I mean, from that point on when you've got your perfect residence and you're full, it's like things are going to change. Things change short. every day. <laughs> it should be short-lived. One of those six residents or could, could pass or end up in the hospital or move to another facility. Um, it's ever-changing. So this business will definitely keep you busy mentally, physically, emotionally. But like Cheryl said, it can be extremely rewarding um, when you when you see the impact that you can have on people's lives, their families, with grandchildren getting to come and visit their loved ones. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's an important question to ask, and you need to ask yourself as we go through the financials and all the different things. Um, are you going to be an involved owner? Are you going to be an owner operator? Um, it's not like, you know, a subway franchise where you buy a subway franchise in Miami and I live in Daytona Beach and it and it runs because I got. I mean, you're the owner operator. Are you going to be involved and make sure that that things operate um, smoothly? Do do you, Cheryl? Do you think that? employees would have the same interest that that you would have no unfortunately not um i mean we have some excellent caregivers so i really can't say that but you know at the end of the day it's it's they work their shift and they're fantastic but you know it's it's it falls all on your shoulders you're the, you're the one it's your business right. your heart right so owner operator to me um is is so important that you're going to be involved, um, that you may be able to have, may have to work shifts. Uh, we highly recommend it unless you have deeper pockets um, or you're really good at marketing and you, your best asset is to be out there marketing. But, um, you know, being able to work shifts is going to be an important key to your success in the beginning. So why would a family choose you? Um, we call it the unique selling proposition, USP. And... What is it about your home, about you, that, that makes this special? And I think that you need to start thinking about that. Are you a nurse or are you a physical therapist or are you an administrator by trade? Um, 
whatever it is that you do. Are you a pharmacist? Are you, um, what other skills do you bring from a different career? If you're transitioning from another career, like we did, um, we came from more service industry, we turn that into an asset. And our unique selling proposition is that we're from the service industry and we bring that to uh, this side, of the assisted living side of things. So why would they choose you? What is unique about your business? And start to develop that story, develop that, um, that pitch. They call it an elevator pitch. And it really means if I were to, if we were in a big networking meeting and, and you had 10 seconds to stand up and say something about your business, how would you be able to say it? What would you say that everybody in the room would say, wow, that place is special? And, you know, I'm, we, when we first opened, uh, we went to a big networking meeting in town and new members got to stand up and say something. And luckily, um, I was I shaking, it. I was shaking inside and I, and I said, Cheryl, will you do it? And she said, no problem. There must've been 200 people in the room, all in the industry. And, uh, yeah, Cheryl, do you remember? Oh, I remember standing up, but I don't have a problem with public speaking. So it was, uh, I don't remember what I said, but people wanted to come up and speak with us afterwards. So I did make some sort of an impact. Yeah. I think you said something about we're a family business and, you know, there was myself, my dad, who's, um, involved my, my, my wife and Cheryl, and we all were there. And, um, I think what she said, something like we're in the family business and, um, you know, that is different, but we've definitely evolved our, our, unique selling proposition since then so okay so <clears throat> so you know that this is right for you uh, you know what makes you unique about about uh, your business and the next thing I'd say is location Cheryl you want to touch on location a little bit uh, when you're choosing your location you want to make sure that you do not have another facility that is too close to your um, perspective facility, the one that you're going to um, hopefully open. Um, the rule right now is a thousand feet away from another facility that could change, um, but make sure that you're aware of who's around you. That's right now opening. as of August 2014. Okay. Right. <laughs> um, but, you know, definitely check in case they change the rules. Um, there are exceptions to the rules and stuff. You'll have to um, take that up with your city. Um, council members and um, ACA licensing unit. Um, things that people don't realize is you don't always have to buy your house. You can rent a house. Um, it's up to your landlord, and I would suggest being very honest with them on what you're going to do. Um, make sure that there's not an HOA in the neighborhood that would oppose to it or cause any delays or problems for you. And uh, Cheryl, can I just, before mm -hmm. we, I just want to mention about the location. The way you search for a location now, a thousand feet is not very big. It's about three football fields. So keep that in mind. But the way you would search is you go to Aka's website, okay? And um, I'll, I'll include it in the video um, later. But the way you do it is you go to Aka's website, find a facility. <coughs> I think it's called Facility Locator. And then I know we've we've showed you this in other parts, maybe the marketing part. And then you put in your address and you put distance and just put like one mile or something like that and it'll pull up all the facilities uh, within a mile and I don't think I don't think it's it's only assisted living facilities I think it also includes other community uh, residential facilities so you got to check that rule but it so that's how you do your search now one thing that's extremely important about this before we move on is that there may not be one right now, but if you you need to get your place licensed, and during that process, you don't know if somebody else within that vicinity um, is at the same point at, or further along in the process of applying. So, you know, I definitely go down to the, the building and zoning department, ask if anybody within a thousand feet of you has, a, has a gone in and get the, got their zoning form signed, uh, if they're aware of any other facilities um, that are in that application process. You can also call ACA's uh, licensing department 
and ask them, say I'm, I'm about to start the process and I've checked with my zoning department, but I want to know, um, is there anything in process that is within a thousand feet? And the ACA search may also have pending or in process uh, facilities as well, but depending on where, at, at what point uh, the process is going on. So once you make the commitment, you sign the lease or you start to purchase the property, you need to get that thing done. You need to get your application in. You need to have all your ducks in a row ASAP before somebody else does. Uh, but you also don't want to make mistakes on your application because enough, if you do it too many times, they can reject your application. So you want to make sure that you follow the checklist that they give. You do it all exactly the way they do it and um, make sure you get it before somebody else says. So go ahead, Cheryl, sorry. Oh, no. Rent versus buying, yep. Yeah, well, we talked about that. Um, you know, you don't always have to buy your place. Um, you know, buying's great, you own it, you probably have less expensive and less chances that you um, will get evicted or have to move out or the landlord changes his or her mind. Um, the size of the facility, you wanna consider that. Um, so, so many people call us daily and they, um, I open a facility, I'm only going to license myself for four beds. If you have space for eight beds, nine beds, ten beds, why not? I mean, the, the bigger the better. The staffing um, requirements don't change that much when you go up for more people. And, you know, it's just a nice, it makes a nice community. If you have the space, I recommend going up high. But, of course, those are things that your city you'll have to check with, too. Some cities don't license, um, what is Palm Bay Clay, over five beds? <laughs> Well, you know, a lot of it depends on the, um, yeah, the zoning, the zoning department and the fire marshal. Um, usually you can't have a place, uh, you can't have more than eight people without fire sprinklers, according to the NFPA 101. But, you know, ultimately it's determined by the local fire uh, marshal and the zoning authority. So about picking your location, Cheryl said, you know, bigger is better. And you that to me is more important than anything. I mean, location is important, right? Yes. And we'll get into market saturation and not being around too many other facilities and understanding their vacancy rate and their pricing and, and different things like that. But the size of your house or your building is so important and your ability to grow. Uh, for example, if you have the opportunity to get a three bedroom or a four bedroom, to me, there is no doubt in my mind that I would get a four-bedroom. And if I had the opportunity to get a five-bedroom, I wouldn't even think about it and I'd get the five-bedroom unless it was like upstairs, downstairs type of situation or the property was a mess and needed all kind of renovations, then I might go with the four-bedroom. But it is important. And when you go into a property, look at ways that you can change it and maybe you don't need a... Uh, living room, family room, dining room. Maybe you'll, maybe the living room could become another bedroom. Um, things to keep in mind, though, bedrooms can't go. You cannot get. You can have a. a I, I have to have access to a bedroom without going through another bedroom. So you can't have like a railroad type of situation. Your bathrooms capacity, even though technically you're only required to have one bathroom. I think it is per six residents or whatever it is. You can do that, but you won't get residents. And you could get a five-bedroom house that are really, 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 really small bedrooms or that aren't appealing and don't have windows or whatever it is. And that's great. You can have a five or six. But if if it's not appealing, you're not gonna, a family's not going to choose you unless you're just taking $1,000 a month for somebody. So picking the right property is, it is a make or break. I mean, it, it really is. And... Just because something is available and the landlord's willing to work with you as far as a rental or um, the only things to choose from for sale are these properties, then maybe you just need to wait. And a lot of times, as a, you know, you're excited. Right now, you're really excited and you want to open your place. And that's the only thing that you have on your mind. But you can't be blinded by it and say, oh, well... Um, this is not perfect, but it'll do. And when we get into the cost to start up and the cost to operate and all those things, you'll see the difference between that extra bedroom is dramatic. So 
uh, bathrooms, separate entrances. I mentioned expansion. So I'll give you an example. I know of a facility, they started out as a five bed place, but they had the room um, and it was, it was in an area that wasn't like a, a homeowners association like Sarah, Cheryl said. And um, they actually recently after five, six, seven years, it might have been longer, they expanded it to 17. They had the space in the back and they had the ability to increase zoning and change zoning. Um, so can in your community, can the garages be converted to living space? That is a great question to ask your local zoning authority because I'll tell you right now, garages are pretty much useless except for storage, right? Yeah. <laughs> what did Cheryl? Oh, I went to one ALF, and that's where they had they had beds on the floor, and they had living staff sleeping there. It was atrocious, but um, oh gosh, don't do that, guys. You can get don't do that. Tamaka. But as far as garages, if they can be converted, if that's allowed in your area in your city, then that makes that house a little bit more attractive. Um, so, does it have a den? If it has an office. You probably don't need an office. A lot of times, administra people open a facility. I see it all the time when I visit some of our care association members. They have a living room. They have a family room, a dining room, an office. And they have their whole computer set up and a big fancy desk in their office. And I'm like, why do you have this office as a office? You have a, a four-bedroom house, but this office could be your fifth bedroom. Well, I never thought about that. Where would I put my office? Put your office in the garage. That's what we did. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so, you know, we put AC, we made it nice, and our office became our garage. And more more times than not, the people that, I, that did that, they were extremely happy that they did. Um, and it, it'll make a difference. For Let's just use this example. Let's say you have a three-bedroom house, and you're going to get licensed for six residents. Okay, so if you have three bedroom house, that means you can do two, um, you could do two rooms would be shared, which means double occupancy, right? Two residents in one room, two residents in another, and then you have another room, um, somebody wants a private room. Well, even though you're licensed for six, what are you gonna turn away the person that wants the private room? So you have a, you're at five. But if you had that office instead, you can use that other office and get to six, and you could have two private rooms and two shared rooms. It's a huge difference. Um, otherwise, all you can do to get to six is is um, uh, six shareds, and you're going to be a lot more limited in the type of people that you get and the amount of money that you can get when you're doing only shareds. Yeah, people like private rooms. We we don't have that many shared in the last gosh five or six years have we mm -mm. no really i mean people like their privacy it's, it's just nice right so you know four bedrooms is better than three and five bedrooms is better than four with the exception of upstairs downstairs so you know if you have a choice i hope you do um don't take the upstairs downstairs unless upstairs is just like a loft and you're just going to use it as an office or something office or something like that that's that's fine so what is the um the zoning right what is the zoning on the property is it a multifamily property is it commercial even better commercial even better um is there land extra land i think we talked about that a distance to other facilities and Market sac saturation, Cheryl, you want to talk about doing a little market research? You did a little opposition research, didn't you? I did. I, I went ahead and um, called facilities in our immediate area and inquired about their rates, um, what type of rooms they had, what services they provided, what was included in the rate, if they had different tiers or level of care service that they charged for. Um, and we even went and toured some of the places to get some ideas. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times if you go to a larger community, they're very welcoming because they want to um, get referrals from you, too. So um, a few places gladly showed us around, took us on a nice tour. Um, you know, you can also be sneaky. 
and um, if you want, if you're calling smaller homes, they may not be as willing to give you information, so you may have to do a little bit of sneaky work and pretend like you're looking for your grandma for a place and get information that way, too. Uh, but I do yeah, recommend but... you, you check and see what everybody else is doing in your area. It's a must. You have to. Because if you're doing projections and you think you're going to get $3,800 or $4,000 for a private bed, and um, in the area that you're going to open, people are struggling to get $2,200 or $3,000, then you're being unrealistic and your projections are not accurate. And, um, you know, when you do go call around, first of all, um, don't be rude. And don't expect people to just volunteer and give you all kinds of free information. Um, you know, definitely have a good story. <laughs> okay, don't, you know, uh, they're going to ask you who it's for, or what are their needs before they even give you prices. They're going to ask, like, Look, tell me about your mom. Tell me about her. No, remember um, that guy that came? All right. It was, uh, there was this guy that came. I don't know. He was maybe in his late forties. I think at the most he could could have been right around fifty, N not too old, maybe even young forties. And he knocked on the door, and I, you know, greeted him, "Hi, how are you? What what can I help you with?" And he says, "Well, I'm looking for a place for my, um, I think he said his mom or something." And I'm, he looks nervous to me, and. uh he really couldn't look me in the eye. And just right away, I, f I thought he was a spy. I just, my my radar went off. And uh, so I started asking him some some questions. Um, well, what um, kind of needs does she have? And, you know, he answered very vaguely, like, oh, you know, just assisted living needs. And so I started probing him more and more with, you know, Alzheimer's, different kind of tough questions. And he just, he folded right away. He said, all right, I, I have to tell you the truth. Um, I, I, I don't have a mom that needs assisted living. I want to open a place down the street. I just wanted to see what you did and get information on your facility. Um, so I, I've shut him down right away. But uh, he, he just couldn't continue to lie to me. So um, yeah. it, was, it was interesting. He continued to call us and ask oh, us questions. God. and it's like, go away. But, you know, you're going to get that. And because all these other facilities, especially the owner-operators, I mean, they're on guard as well. So... Not saying you need to be nervous, but you you need to think it through before you before you call. So you definitely need to get. I mean, it's just listen. They did it too. They should have done it, and um, it it's just part of the business. And so, but definitely, I would start by going to the larger communities, and um, they're going to welcome you with open arms, and show you around. You'll get an idea of of at least the larger community prices. Um, I don't think that you're going to be comparing yourself price-wise to larger communities. Um, that they're, they're, it's just different. But you need to be aware of it because people will tour. Your, they want to tour your facility, and then they'll they'll also be touring larger communities. And they may say, "Well, why is it cheaper at the larger community and yours is more expensive?" And then it's because, well, you're, that's your starting price. And there's a lot of things that that you'll have to learn to counteract. And it depends on your market. Um, you know. And, and things change. A new facility may open up, like in our market, a new 120-bed facility opened up, and it it put a huge hamper, um, a damper on our on our uh, move-ins. And Clay, remember their starting rates advertised? I think we're eighteen hundred. Right. And most I would say the average in the area is what thirty three thousand, thirty two hundred, thirty five at the time, and they just you know, and. Uh, just, yeah, but the, all they did was they filled up and then their rates went up rates higher. Went up, but, right, but it but hurt it, for a while. Yeah, because we we would have people come in and we'd tell them our rates, which we think were reasonable. And, um, you know, they would say, wow, that's expensive. And, and that happened literally overnight where we people used to say that's affordable. And then, then the next week people were saying, oh, my God, that's so expensive because – you know they're they're price shopping and they're comparing us what they get here with this big community and they get the transportation and they get the bells and whistles and I get my own apartment and swimming what pool. Are you, that's right. So <laughs> you, it's good research to do ahead of time and then you can also watch how other people do tours and explain things and talk about programs and it's good um, to do and I definitely do it before you 
before you purchase a property, before you um, rent a property, or anything else. Okay, so um, prices, you'll understand the pricing in your market, and then you'll also understand the vacancies in your market. People won't always volunteer how many vacancies they have, but you can tell because, first of all, if you call a facility and you leave a message and they don't get back to you, and you leave a message and they don't get back to you. They're full. <laughs> they're probably full or they're incompetent. But, um, or if when you visit a facility, a large facility, they'll, they'll probably say, well, I only have one room or I only have one like this or one like that. And, you know, it varies, vacancies vary, but if they're full and, um, that's a good indication that that your area has a, a lower vacancy rate, but don't you will have vacancies. So even if a place is full, um, I would just plan, and we'll talk about that in the um, financials section. But a vacancy rate is to be expected. Okay, so uh, let's get into some of the financials. Let's start with startup costs. Now, one thing I want to I want to urge here is that. These startup costs include almost everything you would need, and it is high, and it's going to shock you. And but I think it's important for you to understand that, um, you know, what your total outlay could be. So when you look at the list and you start to see it all broken down, you can say, okay, that's something I'll do myself. Or um, I see the television on the list is this much but I, I need the other things you can prioritize things on the list to get your budget down and say okay I'm gonna go use my TV from my house or I'm gonna borrow a TV from my friend or I'm gonna go get I'm gonna start looking at at Goodwill or thrift shops for a TV because um, wherever you can ahead of time start to cut these costs I think it's it's extremely important Okay, so first of all, your down payment on your house, if you're going to, or deposit, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to pretend like you're renting, okay? Let's just say you're renting and the rent is like $1,800 a month. So you have to come up with first and security. But if you tell them you're doing assisted living, they may say, I want first, last, and security. That's entirely possible. So that's what, 1,800 times three? So that's um, that's a big chunk of money, okay? So that's 5,400, 5,400. In, in this breakdown, I only put a deposit and down or down payment of $3,000. So you're gonna need to adjust that because you know, your rent may only be $1,000 or $800, but um, you know, don't be surprised <laughs> if you tell them it's assisted living, it goes up. Um, okay, so when you're trying to get licensed, Cheryl, what would you think, what would you say the, the time it takes to get licensed? Um, like from the time you submit your application? Or no, I would what? say from the time that you start you thinking start about it. To, when you have to start paying for the property. Well, gosh, we started working on ours in It took us, June, we left ours open for a year, but... And then we didn't get licensed till April. Yeah, I mean, but it we, took a we while. we did some extra steps. True. But... So maybe... I think I've heard people say it takes three to four months. Yeah, I would, I would, I would plan on four to six months. Yeah, I think that's safe. Four to six months. And, it, and there are so many components, you know, you need to get your fire alarms installed you need to um, get your health inspections done and you need to submit you need to get your emergency plans your contracts all these things that that need to be done um, so right there alone you're vacant for four to six months you just add that in to your startup cost in this scenario I just put five thousand dollars to cover the mortgage so that that's something to keep in mind right there right Okay, maybe the best solution is um, a family member moves into it and let I let them rent it out at a lower price for five months while I'm getting it licensed. Or maybe I move into it while I'm waiting for it to get licensed. And if we're talking about trying to, you know, bare, uh, bare bones, you know, 
on a bootstrap budget trying to get this done. Those are the type of things you need to think about and plan for that this could take six months to get licensed or more. So don't just say, okay, here, I'll just have it vacant for six months and then I'll, you know, I'll do this and I'll do that because once you start getting into the other costs, it's going to elevate it. Okay, next. Does the place need any renovations? I didn't put any prices in here because you, you could figure it out on your own. Does the place need paint? Do they have bathtubs? You don't have to take the bathtubs out of all of all of the property. I mean, all of the bathrooms. But it's if it's you easier. care. <laughs> oh my god! It will help your staff. It will help on your tours when people walk in. I can't tell you how many times people say, "Oh, look, they have no bathtub." Actually, almost and, everybody um, asks if they don't ask, and they they say something when they see it, Clay. That's right. You know, it's a big issue. They they know how how would my mom or dad step into a bathtub. And in fact, sometimes that's one of the reasons why they're moving mom or dad from the house because it's got stairs, because it's got a bathtub, because it's got a step in shower, because it's got whatever it is, it's got a sunken living room. So I'm not, you know, you, if you're renting, the landlord is probably not going to let you take the bathtubs out. No. So that's just something to keep in mind. I mean, you could ask. You could say, hey, I'm going to renovate your bathroom, but I'm going to make a shower. And you never know. You never know. Um, but does it need painting, bathrooms removed? Does it need bathroom renovations? I mean, you can't have a place that's ugly or not in good repair because you won't get people. I mean, it's just, it's just the way it is. Does it have bad flooring? Does it have dirty carpet? Do you need to put tile? Do you need to put uh, change the floors out? Those are things you need to consider when you're considering one property or another renovations does the kitchen need to be renovated um you know a dirty kitchen an old kitchen is not good does does it need landscaping and i think i might have included landscaping further on down in the budget but whatever property you get i would do landscaping if you can do it yourself that's great buy some nice plants make the outside look really great i think that's extremely important um a patio or or outdoor access the the rules and regulations require you to provide um, access to the outdoors uh, it's not just access it's supposed to be easy access to the outdoors um, doesn't mean you leave everything unlocked but a screen patio with, with a locked doors is easy access to the outdoors um, so does it have a patio does the patio need renovation does it need a new screen if there's no screen patio i mean is there is there does it need a fence around the backyard uh those are things to consider next we go into anything on that cheryl no okay advertising and marketing um you're gonna have to buy business cards so we use a company called got print i think i covered it in the um marketing and advertising basics section so we use a company called, called Got Print. I think you can get a thousand business cards for fifty dollars or something like that. Um, and then there's a company online that you can use. That it's in the marketing section about business cards to design it. Brochures, Got Print, hundred dollars for a thousand or maybe not thousand, maybe five hundred. Don't go overboard when you're buying business cards and brochures because you will make mistakes the first time you do a run. So really cut it down to one or 200, uh, keep it low. And then the next time you reorder, I know you're gonna wanna make changes. Your website, um, personally, I mean, I know you need a website. So don't skimp on a website, but don't go sp call some company and have them wanna charge you $1,000 or $5,000. If, you know, to me, you shouldn't spend more than $500 on a website, if even that. And um, so ads, ads are something you cannot technically start running ads until um, you're licensed, okay? So... But you'll see people doing it. You will see people doing it. But it doesn't mean you can't have, a, have it budgeted because the minute you get licensed, right, you get your license back in the mail is the minute you're going to be, you already have a, an advertising campaign and you already know what you're going to do to get the word out there. But like I say in the marketing section, you know, you can't just do one ad and expect people to come 
banging down your door unless you're given assisted living for a thousand dollars networking meetings uh, membership dues there will be costs to joining these memberships so you need to budget for that that's something you can start right away definitely 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 find all the local networking meetings and sign up for all of them and go to them all every month um, now don't don't go into these meetings and just spam people and say oh, I'm opening for get to know them and what they do and and their business you're better off just listening more than you are talking in the beginning so um, networking meetings membership now the next thing we got to consider is um, oh I think I skipped over signs making some signs is a really good thing so little um, co corrugated plastic signs that you can have printed maybe fifty dollars a sign or less they even have them at Office Depot um, blank ones that you can write on there or get an open house sign and, but write assisted living I covered that in the marketing but these signs you can put them out um, you know before you open coming soon assisted living and then as soon as you open that definitely the sides gonna, signs gonna go in the yard while you're there open house assisted living open house type of thing so signs we budget about a hundred dollars for those um, entertainment so you'll need televisions uh, DVD players television eight hundred dollars DVD players sixty dollars games puzzles magazines uh, hundred and fifty dollars if you want to buy a Wii you can buy a Wii so you can um, do Wii bowling or different types of games for for the residents so two hundred dollars but you may have one at the house so you use that and not only um, Kalei, like mm -hmm. we for the residents but a lot of times at our facility um, their grandkids come to visit and um, you know they have younger children with them and um, I find the kids play the Wii and it gives them something to do and residents like to watch them yep. and you know it is something that and I'm not telling you go run out and buy a Wii but I'm saying if you have one and you can borrow one or you pick one up at a thrift shop or something like that something um, nice to have now our it, son would say he needs an Xbox too yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. maybe so, Santa will bring that to the facility that's right um, a music player oh and also our staff their their kids come and play games as well so that's always nice to have the staff's kids they get to come and hang out for a little bit but the, um, another thing is some sort of music player, maybe a Bluetooth music player that you pick up at uh, Be uh, Best Buy for 100 bucks that ties in with your iPhone or something simple that you can play music for some of the activities that you're going to be doing, like if you did some sort of chair exercise program or uh, something to play during special events. Uh, movies, you can buy some movies. I put $50 in here. Uh, you could definitely start looking at Ross. I know we did that. We started looking for, you know, cheap movies there, old-time movies on sale at Ross or TJ Maxx or stuff like that. So start, if you start looking ahead of time while you're waiting this four to six months to open, then you can really defer and cut down on the cost. Um, furnishings. You want to talk about furniture, show? I, um... Yes, I learned about furniture. We um, bought very nice furniture for the facility. Uh, we bought cloth furniture to start, and that was really a bad idea and a waste of money. Um, think about it. All the people that are coming and going through your facility, the couches get dirty. Um, sometimes residents soil them, or they'll spill drinks, um, even children that are visiting. And they just really didn't weather well in that kind of environment. So we upgraded our furniture to um, leather. You don't necessarily have to get leather. They have other alternatives that are leather-like that are very durable. And that's what I would recommend. It's just, you know, you don't want your facilities to smell of urine. And let's face it, um, you know, they do have accidents sometimes or leaks. And it would get into the fabric, and it's just not a good thing. So. Yeah, and you don't want to put plastic over your furniture. No, that doesn't it's look not good. nice. <laughs> It's just that it, it doesn't appeal to people when you're doing a tour, and so, you know, think about what the... they want to live in. That's that's always how they exactly. look at it. They always 
say, oh, wow, this place, when they come to our place, this is nicer than my own house. I want to live here. So you have to really appeal to the decision makers, too. Right. And so uh, some people may go and buy their furniture from a thrift store or just throw some pieces together. But, you know, when you go to a, a home builder's model home, that's not what they do. They put their money in the staging of the home. They make it look like, I mean, it's a model home, right? So you, you're doing tours. You're, you need to have it looking really good. And I'm not saying buy the nicest furniture, but try to buy a set of some sort that go together and match. And um, like Cheryl said, synthetic leather over regular leather. Another thing to consider is that don't get a couch or something that is too deep when you sit in it, if it's too soft and you sink too far down, when you have people who need to be able to stand up, it's so much harder for them to stand up from a, a sunken position. So maybe something a little bit more firm that's a little bit more elevated that isn't, isn't as hard for them to get to a standing position would be ideal. Well, and you know, in Florida, we have like um, rooms to go. I think that's all over the state and they have really good package prices. I think you get a leather like package for a thousand dollars. Yeah. So it's worth and it. And you can finance it, Yeah, right? you can finance it. Good interest so, rates. Credit cards. Um, yeah. And when you're thinking about your dining room table, this is this was a difficult thing to find. As you need to get a large family-style dining room table. Um, something yeah. that's going to seat um, six to eight people, maybe even ten. And you have to keep in mind wheelchairs, too. Um and then also leg placement of the table. Um, yeah. If the wheel if the legs are too weird, then when you try to put a, a a wheelchair, even just try to put a resident in there, they won't be able to put their legs in. So Cheryl said the wheelchairs. Um, some tables are they have these things that block that people won't be able to get in if they're sitting in a wheelchair. So definitely want to you know have it easy access as possible. So I think. The tables that we get, um, well, we kind of found one brand and, and we stick with it because it's just nice and big. But um, definitely a big dining room table. Because, you know, not only will you have your residents, but you could also have guests or you could have family. And the staff could sit down with them as well, depending on how you run your facility. Um, but it, it can be a problem. So bedroom furniture... Um, you know, uh, we, when we started, we furnished our whole place. It really depends. Are you doing private? Or are you doing shared? Um, the shared rooms, you probably will want to furnish it so that it's, um, in compliance. Well, yeah, it depends. I mean, it really depends. People could move furniture into a shared room. And as long as they have nice things that, that are tasteful, it's something you'll need to put on the contract, you know, that says that you have the right to turn away items that uh, are inappropriate because they're in a shared space. So it could be too big and too bulky and take up too much of the room. And it's not fair to the other person who's sharing space. And the shared room contract might actually have to spell it out that if you bring furniture, the dresser can be no bigger than this and da, 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 da. Um, but definitely when you're doing a tour and you want to show people a shared room, they might want to see a shared room with furniture that's there. So you might need to furnish a shared room and possibly a private room to stage it just to show them what it looks like. Especially I'd say for a smaller room. Um, well, the thing that I like is that when there's furniture, um, people, let's say you, for example, listening to this, um, you have a house and in your house, you usually have a queen size bed or a king size bed. That's where you're used to seeing in a room. So when you walk in a 10 by 10 room, the first thing you think of is this is small. This is small. But in reality, um, most of your residents are going to be in a twin size bed or a hospital bed or something like that. They really don't need a full size bed. And so if you stage it properly with a nice twin size bed, or even a, a double bed that's small and you can you can put it in the right way so it's maybe in the corner and you might be able to furnish it with a little sitting area and a TV area and it just gives people the oh look I look how it's it they'll say wow look at all that you can fit in this room but in reality is that 
uh, you're furnishing it properly and uh, it will make a difference so you if you have that stuff great I'm not saying run out and go break the bank and go uh, uh, you know go crazy on it because you do need if you have that extra money I would rather see you putting in advertising or marketing and um, try to figure out how to make it look nice would you say that makes sense Cheryl? absolutely yeah don't go crazy on it but it is extremely important decorations um, decorations are extremely important as well you know spruce it up nice pictures and things that you can pick up at Ross and make it make it just feel like a, a model home and uh, lighting is important um, if Aka comes through with the health department they could actually take light readings in fact I think the health department will take health readings I mean um, light reading light readings yeah so um, lighting if it's too dark change the light bulbs put accent lights um, you know you don't want it dark and dingy right correct L let as much natural light in as you possibly can um, linens you're gonna have to buy the linens initially to, to furnish it we we provide all of our linens in our facility and I'll I'll tell you why is because if um, a person brings linens in for their parents and they bring like 300 thread count sheets and they've got the special um, uh, pillowcases embroidered with the initials of dad and mom and they've had that since they were then when they got married it was a wedding gift and your staff takes it and puts bleach on it and ruins it I mean we 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 provide linens we provide uh, sheets towels uh, blankets and am I missing something else washcloths um, washcloths we provide lots of washcloths pillows right we do the pillows that way nothing you know the staff can do all the sheets and nothing really matters they can use a lot of bleach they can use fabric softener if they if they turn pink it's no big deal so you know keep keep that in mind for for linens but i do let we do allow people to bring their own but i just let them know up front that there is a, we can't control how they're washed how they you know if they're going to be kept in the residence room we'll try our best we ask them to label with their names but um you know they're going to get mixed up eventually that's right and you, you it will happen so um so uh, bath accessories, um, we always ask our residents to bring. That's something that we don't provide. Um, we provide soap, and we have shampoo and stuff. We have hand soap. Um, but if you have any, people have any specialty lotions, or any, we don't do any of that. But So the families bring that. But you'll need accessories. You'll need plungers. You'll need, uh, you know, scrub brushes. You'll need um, hand towel holders because if it's a shared bathroom so let's say you have a three bedroom house and two bathrooms one of the bathrooms is in the master bedroom and the other bathroom is shared by four other residents right because you have a six bed facility then that bathroom cannot have just a regular cloth towel to clean the hands uh, every health department is different but I'm I can guarantee you when the health department comes through that's one of the things they're gonna look and make sure that you have a paper towel dispenser to dry your hands um, Aka will for shared for bathrooms. Too. Aka, hmm? Aka will yep. as well, right, okay. So uh, so bathroom accessories you're gonna need, we put that in here at 200 bucks, linens $500, lighting $100, decorations $500, private uh, bedroom, bedroom furniture, a thousand dollars. Dining room. You're seeing these numbers as we talk, and it's um, it's going to add up. So cleaning supplies. You're going to need. I don't know why that's in furnish furnishings, but two hundred dollars cleaning supplies. Will you need patio furniture? I talked about. You need a nice, appealing outdoor space. It is extremely important. Outdoor access, patio furniture. Do you need it's a patio required fan? Too. It is required. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, kitchen. Do do you need a new refrigerator? Is the one that you have dirty? Is it broken down? Is it ugly? Do you do you have a good washer and dryer? Um, do you need to, you know, sometimes rentals don't come with washer and dryer. Um, I definitely get used appliances for me. I mean, that's we found a good used guy and he repairs them and things like that. You're gonna need to buy food. 
Um, that won't come until you probably get your first resident. But you can start buying things ahead of time. Condiments, salt, pepper, you, you know how those things just add up extremely fast. So start to think about that. Um, pots, pans, dishes, maybe you have extra pots and pans. Maybe you can pick some up at Walmart or Target. Um, but you know, wherever you can find them at a discount, pots and pans, you, you could definitely get those at a, at a uh, Salvation Army or Goodwill or something like that and try to be frugal in as many places. There's a microwave oven, a coffee maker, toasters, silverware, cooking tools, glassware dishes. Uh, except for the glassware dishes, you know, I definitely would, would try to find nice dishware. Um, a lot of... Because I like yep, dishware yep. too. Light, yes. not heavy. Not heavy plates. Not yeah, heavy smaller cups. cups yeah. Plastic small plastic cups are good for uh, glassware something that somebody can wrap their hand around um, so the the light plates are important and um, nothing too crazy with colors I, I don't think that's good not either for, distraction not for your Alzheimer's residents yeah you want something a little bit more plain and soothing and I think it makes the food more appealing when the it's not as much going on the food is the, uh, the highlight but but you know, a lot of you got to realize that that most of the time, your family family members are going to be visiting their mom or dad or loved one at meal time, because that's after work, that's before work, that's lunch breaks. So when they come and visit, they're so make it look nice. You know, have centerpieces, have tablecloths, have nice um, napkins. Um, make it really appealing because. That's one thing that you're going to get a lot of complaints on, even if your food is good. Right, Cheryl? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> you're going to get complaints on food. And, um, you know, if the family's there and they see, like, wow, look at, the, look at these meals. They're beautiful. I wish I could eat like this. And it's, and it's amazing. That goes a long way to giving them comfort when they leave that, that my mom, even though she complains, I know that she's being provided for really well so you know try to avoid all the process prepackaged you know fake foods try to try to uh try to do things from scratch you know like that's one of the that's one of your your unique selling propositions and i know we're talking about food and 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 and, and we're not talking about but it is part of opening a facility and understanding um you know what's important so from scratch, no TV dinners. Um, I understand that sometimes chicken pot pies and frozen lasagna is good, but you could still dress it up, have a beautiful salad. You can have other side veggies, uh, nice dessert. Right, Cheryl? Yeah, but, you know, our residents personally, they prefer canned vegetables over fresh. So, I mean... You know, it's totally not ruled out. Just um, find out what the resin's like and try to serve nice whole foods. Right, right. Okay. Okay, so that's kitchen supplies, just things to keep in mind. Um, now, fire, health, and safety. These are things that you're going to need with regard to that. Um, I will start off by saying... In our area now, every fire marshal is different, right? When you when you when you first thing you're going to do is you're going to print out the application and get the checklist and understand everything that you're going to need to open your facility. And in core training, you know, we go through the whole checklist with you. But one of those things is you got to get a fire alarm. What the fire alarm is? What what components make up the fire alarm? Uh, do you need sprinklers? Do you need the smoke detectors hardwired? Uh, do you need them tied into the fire alarm panel so that when the smoke alarm goes off, they're notifying the fire department? Do they want, uh, what decibel of the alarm is, um, is required? What the strobe lights, how bright do the strobe lights have to be? How many do they have to be? How, how uh, do you need heat, heat detectors? So these are all questions that I can't answer for you because it's determined uh, primarily, it's determined by your local fire marshal. So uh, what you would do is you would, you would start searching for your fire alarm company. And the way I would do that is I would go to the uh, local zoning office 
and I would, uh, especially if you're in a bigger city, I would go down to the zoning office, the building department, and I would say, hey, I'm about to go and do this. I need this form signed, which is the uh, zoning form, and I was wondering if you could suggest or recommend any alarm companies uh, to install my alarm, and, and they'll know a lot of the alarm companies that, that apply for permits and um, uh, zoning I'm sorry, uh, building permits and fire permits. So they may be able to give you a recommendation. You also may be able to get a recommendation if you go to some of these networking meetings. But definitely call around, call like 10, 12 of them, get your estimates because they'll drum, they'll range dramatically. My first three estimates for our fire alarm was 10 and $12,000. And then my fifth estimate or whatever it was, was uh, $4,200. And I meet people still who have different estimates, um, so it all depends. So what the what the fire, what the alarm companies will do, is they will um, contact the fire marshal, find out the requirements. They'll probably un already know it, with each city within the county, um, what the requirements are. So each city has a different fire marshal usually. So on here, uh, if for us we were required to have self-closing doors, which means when you go into a resident's bedroom and you open the door, the door closes automatically behind you. I bought those self-closing things from Lowe's or Home Depot. Maybe they were $20 a piece, $30 a piece. I can't really remember. So I did just put on here $50 just in case um, you needed better ones. Fire alarm system, $4,500. Could be much more depending if you need a, um, a sprinkler system. So sprinkler systems can be $10,000. They can be expensive. Now, we ha also had to remove um, normal construction of houses, only require uh, a hollow door. So if you tap on your door, you can hear if it's hollow. A lot of times, the fire marshal will require you to put in solid core doors, usually three-quarter doors. And those are solid wood. And, and the reason for that is if there's a fire in, say, the kitchen, the solid core door has a a time rating that it will take two hours to burn through that door before it gets to the bedroom. So there may be an, uh, an elderly person in the bedroom and because you have a solid core door, it's, it's a, a barrier to that fire spreading quickly through, through the house and uh, getting to that person gives them time to get people, get the people. And the self-closing door mechanism is why um, that's important as well. So self-closing doors, door, solid core doors, uh, each solid core door can cost up to $200 uh, just for the door so you need to consider it being installed as well so if you have a and they're bedroom doors so if you have a three bedroom house you probably or might need three solid core doors now don't go run out and buy these before you find out what the requirements are um, but don't be surprised if they tell you these are the things that you need solid core doors self-closing uh, mechanisms another thing the health department is going to request is a double sink um, so one is for hand washing and one is for dishes. And you'll have to label the two, hand washing and dishes. So your sink can't just be a single sink, but you could also have um, a, a sink put in the garage. I personally would recommend that splurge money on that and put a sink in the garage as well. If you can fit it between the um, washer and dryer, that'd be great. So your staff can clean out mop buckets and things like that. Um, it is something that the health department will look for. So I'm just gonna put in here $200 for the double sink. Maybe you have one already, um, but you, you'll need to get it installed as well. So think about that. Now grab bars, ACA will require grab bars. Whether or not they, they look uh, is one thing, but you know, you're gonna wanna put grab bars in the bathrooms. So you need one behind the toilet, one next to the toilet. Um, one in two in the shower so I estimate four grab bars per bathroom the grab bars range the smaller ones are about $25 at Lowe's or Home Depot and then the large long ones are probably $50 prices change all the time I'm always surprised how much things change but um, so I estimate that if you have two bathrooms which I hope you have three but if you have two um, estimate $500 for grab bars and they can just be screwed into the tile and but so uh, shower chairs 
Um, I put on here $150 for, that'd be like $75 for two shower chairs. That's if you went out and bought them retail. Estate sales, Goodwill, uh, Salvation Armies, those places, no problem. Garage sales, buying shower chairs for $5. If somebody passed away, nobody wants their shower chair. It's just garbage. And after you open and you have a few residents, you're just going to start collecting these things anyway. And you'll get better ones just because people leave them with you. Um, but initially, you may need some. Uh, but you could also run out and get them when people move in. But it is an expense that we put on here. Commodes. Um, commodes are something that people could have when they come to you, but it's a good idea to have one uh, to put over the toilet that kind of raises the seat up a little bit. And um, you may need to put a commode in someone's bathroom, in someone's bedroom. Uh, I hope that if you do that, you don't have carpet because the chairs are wobbly and they will tape over and they will spill on your carpet and it's uh, it's not pretty. So commodes, plan on, on getting a couple if you can pick them up at the same yard sale or, or Goodwills. Um, should be something you can get inexpensive. They make a higher quality commode that's a little more sturdy. It's like uh, steel rather than aluminum and um, they're heavier and sturdier and wider so you'll want to make sure that the legs all work so they adjust higher and lower make sure your commode comes with the bucket if it doesn't come with a bucket then you know maybe you can order one on Amazon um, a wheelchair is something good to have I have a house wheelchair it was one that, would, that we picked up along the way but um, somebody may move into your facility and not need it but then all of a sudden has a bad week maybe they have a urinary tract infection and they can't walk your staff just needs to go run and get a wheelchair so do I don't go run out and buy a five hundred dollar wheelchair or anything like that but keep it in mind as you're going out in the public meeting with people if you look see something on Craigslist you know go pick it up for ten dollars if you can did I miss something there Cheryl? No not at all okay um, bed rails is another thing keep in mind don't go run out and buy it uh, you can also make them with PVC piping. Get the thicker PVC piping. Uh, don't get the cheap one and make like an L shape that sticks under the mattress. Just something that's helpful. Those are not the most sturdy things though. Um, so keep in mind they do sell bed rails that you can put under a mattress between the box spring. And it's not something you need right away but it's, it is something that you don't want to have to go run out and buy because they really can be expensive uh, full retail. Um, wheelchair ramps, we, we ran out and bought a whole bunch of wheelchair ramps um, for each. We, we bought one for the entrances, we bought one for the patios. Um, it may be something depending on the, the height of your step or, or whatever it is that you want. But I can tell you that wheelchair ramps uh, were really, uh, they, were, they were harder to navigate for our residents. and. When they started going down the wheelchair ramps, they had, they were falling. I mean, they're basically leaning forward. They're in a falling position, so it doesn't help. Getting somebody up over a little step with a wheelchair is no problem. It's actually easier than using a wheelchair ramp, and the wheelchair ramps, uh, it it scares the residents and it makes them panic. And in my opinion, it's just my opinion. It's not legal advice. It's nothing like that. I'm just telling you that we removed all of our wheelchair ramps, so. Um, I put it on here as in a cost potential depending on your situation. Um, but you could also but, build build one out with hand railings that kind of zigzags, you know, that mimics like a hotel or something. It yeah, depends exactly. on your space, but, um, you know, that, that would but be But that's ideal. an expense. Yeah, you need to go and get, check with your zoning, um, your zoning, your building and zoning because they may they may even make you put in wheelchair ramps and and you know what you're not going to win an argument with them so it everything that i'm saying it depends also on your local zoning and building department and fire marshal and health department that uh, they may make you um put in wheelchair ramps they make you make you widen doorways they may make it make it ada compliant like for example um yeah, removing the bathtubs, they may make you they make may make you do all kinds of things. And you know, you really can't fight it because 
they're the position of authority and um, you might just have to do it so some things that we don't know until you go and visit them and say this is what I want to do um, smoke detectors uh, if your smoke detectors are all working and they're in good order that's great but one thing that they may require you to do is to hard hardwire them and what that means is um, if one smoke detector goes off all of the smoke detectors go off and uh, also what it means is that if the if the batteries fail they're hardwired they have electrical going to them um, but that's something that your um, your alarm guys could find out uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't it wouldn't be a bad idea just to give you this advice go talk to your your fire marshal or the person that does the permitting for the fire alarms and ask them what their requirements are before you talk to the fire alarm companies because the fire alarm companies may be telling you you need hardwired uh, smoke detectors and you need this and you need that and you need you need sprinklers and you need all this other stuff but that may not be true that may be true in another city that they've dealt with and they're just assuming that that's the way it's going to be and so unless you know what the real requirements are you may just be taking this person's advice um, and they're ripping you off so definitely uh, I think I said call the fire alarm company first before but definitely now that I think about it I would contact the city and um, and and find out what the requirements are that way you can get a, a real a good estimate um, I we use a call system we use a wireless call system uh, called um, it's called the wireless caregiver and it's got these little wireless care call buttons and all the residents have it they have wireless uh, motion detectors I'll do a video on it or I'll include a video on it in the training but um, the um, call system it's about $250 and it includes the call buttons, motion detectors, a little paging device. You know, uh, you can get little bells as well. It, it depends. But people will ask you about that. Um, permits, fees, and insurance. So you're going to um, need to file your corporate filings if you form an LLC or C corporation or. Uh, whatever you file, however you do it, whatever you form, however you form your company, um, you may have corporate filing fees. So that's something to keep in mind. It may not be $500. You may be able to do it all yourself. I did it all myself in the state of Florida, and I just paid the filing fee and some different things, but it still costs about $100, $150. Uh, financial form preparation this is something that I would definitely consider going to your CPA and having them fill out the financial form is included as a check on your um, application checklist the uh, most applications get sent back because of this financial forms and most applications get denied because of the financial form not be being filled out properly so um, definitely take it to your accountant and have your accountant fill it out unless you think you are good at, at doing that stuff. I had our CPA do it because guess what? Ours got rejected the first time too. And um, I, I talked to another facility owner the other day. They were opening their second facility and their application was approved except for the financial forms preparation and, and the forms. Uh, she already had it done previously and got one facility open, but it's not an easy thing to do. And Cheryl, do you want to touch on that just briefly, the financial forms? Uh, what is it that we have to have updated every year? That We have to have updated every year in the, in the facility records as well? It's just a financial worksheet. It's very simple. Um, mm -hmm. They don't really go through it line by line. I'll go when they inspect, they just make sure it's there. Um, I forgot what the form's called. Is it financial summary sheet, something like that? Um, it's easy to fill right. out. Once you fill it out, you just you know do it every year. Did, do you think that we use we use the form that we had and then we just made copies and signed out, changed the year, or we updated a few numbers? No, I updated we? it because we increased the beds it. every year, so it oh, changed that's right, for that's us. Right. So. That's right. But anyway, um, that is something that needs to be updated every year. So when you do your taxes, um, you know, just ask your accountant to update that form as well. 
Uh, but anyway, I have that at $200. Application fees, when you submit your application, you pay per bed, and then you pay for specialty licenses. So if you have an LNS license or ECC license, an LMH license, I don't know if there's any fees associated with LMH right now, but um, they charge you per bed and they charge you, so um, estimate about $900 for those fees, but the fees are actually in the application. So you just go ahead and check it because things change, they increase fees. Uh, don't go based on this exclusively. Uh, the permit, fire permit, maybe $100. The health department permit um, for the inspection and the permit is, is uh, $100. Then you have to get a city business license, like an occupational license or a business license. That's $50, uh, give or take. And these, a lot of these fees are yearly fees. Liability insurance, so when you submit your application to the state, you're going to have to, um, you're going to have to submit proof of liability insurance. And uh, I believe when we did it for six beds initially, it was about $1,000. So um, you'll want to go to um, Ponce de Leon in the state of Florida does a lot of the policies, Ponce de Leon. And um, let me show you their website here in just a little bit. But they are a risk retention group. They're not necessarily insurance. They pool all the money uh, that all the facilities contribute into a pool and provide coverage. So it's not insurance, it's a risk retention. And you might want to check with your insurance broker or somebody else to find uh, a different alternative, but, in, but liability insurance for an assisted living facility can be extremely, extremely expensive. And that's, uh, they just some background, the state of Florida passed a, a residence bill of rights, which you, you learned in core training that there's a residence bill of rights. Once they pass the bill of rights, a lot of the insurance companies pull out of the state of Florida. And um, so if you, if you try to get liability insurance, uh, you may get quotes like I did for a six bed facility to be uh, $10,000 a year for a six bed place, $10,000 a year. Um, the risk retention group, which has got thousands of facilities, um, was $1,000 a month. But it's, you know, you gotta look at the coverage. Is it right for you? I don't know. I mean, it may only be $25,000 per incident, up to $100,000. Um, and then it, it may not cover, cover medication errors and different things like that. So. Uh, depending on your coverage that you elect is what your policy will be but you'll need liability insurance and you're gonna need to come up with it out of pocket up in advance and then you get the liability proof and um, submit it to the state I think once you do it for a year the next year they will let you um, do some sort of payment plan and um, like I, I don't know what our insurance is now it might be like five thousand dollars Cheryl Cheryl pays it but anyway and um, we do a deposit and then we finance the rest just because we don't want to pay for it all up front but anyway so liability insurance then you have um, then you have um, office supplies filing cabinets now your files they must be stored in a locked filing cabinet. The filing cabinet doesn't have to lock, but it, it has to be locked somewhere behind, in a room that can be locked. So if it's in an office that can be locked or something like that. But anyway, filing cabinets, um, office chairs. So when you, when you meet with families, uh, you want to give them some nice chairs to sit on. Your office is an important component. Although for the first four years we were in business, I literally met families in my garage I painted the floor. It was a garage. There's washer and dryers. Um, so, you know, don't think that you need to have this fancy office. Does it make a difference? Of course it does. But, you know, we survived by uh, just operating in a garage. And I told the people when I met them, I said, listen, I said, this is a garage. I said, we don't put our money in the garage, in our office. You know, we put our money um, where it counts in the care. And it, it was just always the thing I told families, and they thought it always made sense. So, um, but you can get nice chairs. You will have to get chairs for them to sit in, for you to sit in, for for sales reps that come to sit in. Uh, you'll need a desk. Don't go crazy on the desk. Uh, computer. You'll need a computer. 
um, you'll need a monitor, you'll need a printer, a fax machine. So all of these expenses are listed here. A computer $500, printer, uh, fax machine $300. You know, I got a laser printer, black and white. I didn't get color. Um, you may want a color. Now they sell laser color printers that are pretty reasonable. And um, if you don't use a lot of the color and you print in black and white, then you're not going to you're not going to be paying for all the color. But um, ink costs for for those are very expensive. Definitely want to buy your your printer ink online. I think I buy them on Amazon, and they're used cartridges, so they're not the um, they're compatible. They're compatible. So I'll give you an example. My printer ink for my monochrome, which is black and white, uh, laser printer at Office Depot was ninety dollars. I bought the same cartridge or a compatible cartridge online for twenty dollars. So I would buy uh, buy them in packs of five or whatever. So the shipping was free and I didn't have to reorder it all the time. But you will print a lot of stuff. Um, you'll be printing marketing material, or printing contracts, be printing a lot of stuff. So keep that in mind. Don't don't buy an inkjet printer. I think uh, you'll re you'll regret it. Office supplies, you know, miscellaneous things, uh, folders. You'll need binders for sure. You'll need those binders uh, to build your resident files. Um, I don't, you know, the resident file itself, you can get smaller binders. Um, and the medication books, you you know, just depends. It depends on um, how big your storage is, uh, how many drawers you have. So if you have a very small storage space for binders, don't get big binders. Get smaller binders. Um, you'll need you'll need folders. You'll need uh, paper clips, staplers, hole punchers. You know those type of things. You need to start thinking about them ahead of time, um, so you can try to buy them uh, inexpensively. You'll need a phone, right? You'll need a a cordless phone for sure for the house. Um, so that when the resident gets a phone call, you can take the phone to the to them. If you can get one that's good for hearing impaired or a good speakerphone button on it, I think is extremely important. Definitely want to have two handsets. One, um, two handsets are important. If the phone is not easily accessible by the resident, uh, you will get cited for it. If if the resident cannot reach the phone or if they have to come and um, if if they hide the if you cannot you cannot have the phone hidden it's got to be visible it's got to be easy for a resident to be able to pick up uh, that is something that Aka will come and look for um, so you definitely want to have something cordless phones easy but you'll need an office phone as well something in the office that'll ring um, keep that in mind a medication storage cabinet you'll need a medication storage cabinet it could be part of your filing cabinet whatever it is but this medication has to be able to be locked central storage and um, so I think we pick something up at Target that we put a latch on and we have a lock I'll include a picture of it in our uh, in our uh, video here so that totals the um, the startup costs Slightly so it is extremely intimidating and so I I, I, I'm, let me show you the cost. I flipped over to a different sheet here that totals it. And um, something to keep in mind, all those things, you know, you're going to have to change the numbers. This this is a, um, a worksheet in Excel. So whatever number you change, we'll, to we'll change the total at the bottom for you, okay? So if, if you estimate that business cards, oh, I'm just going to print them on my own. I'm just going to pick some uh, ones that I can print. Or I'm not going to do, do business cards, and you take that out, take out excuse me, take out brochures. I can build my own website. I'm going to make my own signs for $10. Um, however you change it, it'll change the total numbers. Um, so like, let's add the double sink. I think I said $200. Okay. So just to give you an idea, everything that we covered here totaled Thirty-one thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars. Ouch! I bet you didn't expect to see that. Thirty-one thousand eight hundred and eighty dollars. 
And the reason why we put so many things in here and we put in the prices that we did is we need you to understand that these are the numbers you're going to be working with. And so before you start your facility or before you um, quit your job or before you do any of that stuff, you need to understand, do I have the budget for it? Uh, where can I cut out? What do I need to cut out? What can't I cut out? Right? And maybe if I have to wait a year and maybe I have to wait six months and I have to save more money uh, because I want to do it right, then then that's what you need to do. Do I think you can do it for less than 31800 Absolutely. I mean, a big number in there that we talked about alone was the um, the rent. That was 5000 right? Furniture. Furniture alone is, I mean, if I went all the way down in furniture, furniture alone is $5,000. So if you are able to figure out a way to get your place but keep it rented for five months while you're going through the process and... Um, you just save ten thousand dollars. What about kitchen supplies? Well, if you could provide all of your own kitchen supplies, there's three thousand dollars you take out of the oh, startup costs. What about the fire stuff and all that stuff you need to keep in there? Corporate filing things you need, but how about our office furniture? Probably save another sixteen hundred dollars. So there are ways you can do it, and you can bootstrap. And I hope that you're handy, or your husband's handy, or your cousin's handy, and can help you paint and remodel and add landscaping and doing these different things. Um, you know, I didn't include a, an amount for landscaping, but I, I definitely would, you know, put $500 in there for plants. If you can plant them yourself, I think it will go a long mm -hmm. way. Especially the front and then the outdoor access um, is what people see. So Cheryl, how about we take a little break and then we're going to come back and we're going to go do the um, the operating expenses, yep. okay? Sounds good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 